The amygdala is an area of the brain network that I like to refer to as the coordinator and the label maker. The amygdala is highly complex. It has several functions and its coordinator function is connected to many other brain hubs in the emotional limbic area. When the amygdala gets notified about a current sensory experience, one coming in from your eyes, your ears, your skin, your nose, your body, it tries to determine the following. If it had a voice, the coordinator aspect of the amygdala would ask, how threatening is this situation? Have we been here before? What should we do? In other words, do I need to send a signal to alert the body so it can prepare to move in case we're in danger? And if an emotional response is activated in the body, the amygdala's label-making function also asks, how can this situation be interpreted or labeled? Should we label it sadness, fear, anger, excitement? What should we call this entire experience? What did we call it before? And if it's a new, and if it's a new experience, how deeply should this experience be stored in memory? In other words, the amygdala is highly involved in both processing and encoding an experience or assigning an experience with a sort of emotional value based on the context. This is what we loosely refer to, like earlier, as meaning making. If an experience is emotionally charged, the amygdala has a part in deeply registering the stimulating experience in memory and making it more memorable, sticky, or what's called salient. That's why times like your wedding day or when a loved one dies or even a vacation when you had so much fun sticks in your memory so clearly. You experienced a strong emotional response during those experiences, so the amygdala's label-making function assigned it a higher value. That way, your brain kind of locks it in more deeply into memory. As we've discussed, what we put into words and call different feelings is part of the label that the amygdala assigns to an emotional neurochemical experience. This labeling or naming can happen almost instantly, quicker than our thinking brain or your intellect can respond. However, if your intellect is given time to respond, it can jump in there use judgment and reasoning, and question the previously conditioned meaning by asking ourselves questions like, is what I'm thinking right now really true? And with this extra time, your intellect can also come up with other possible meanings like, what else could possibly be the reason for whatever. <laughs> if you delay the coordinator's response and your thinking brain or intellect is given time, it will even come up with some other behavior choices, basically giving us some choice in how to respond. But if you don't give it time, the coordinator is just going to jump in there, take over, accelerate an emotional response based on a previously conditioned response, and pretty much dominate your brain's attention. It's like putting a sprinter up against a long distance runner. Your intellect doesn't stand a chance against the coordinator aspect of the amygdala unless you intentionally give it a chance or a head start with time. Now stop, I want you to take that in. Time, training yourself to slow down is one of the easiest and most powerful skills that can retrain your brain, strengthen weakened areas, and create new patterns. And as we just talked about a few minutes ago, this intentional time delay between emotional response and action response with repetition can also strengthen the specific area that handles conflict or that ACC. So the summary, slowing your brain down gives you more control of comprehensive choice in your life. And making whole brain comprehensive choices strengthens your brain. Now, I know none of this is easy. 
preventing yourself from reacting with words, thoughts, or behavior when you're having a powerful physical, emotional experience can be really hard. It's like large scale impulse control. But like anything, it does get easier with practice. Keep reminding yourself just because you feel something doesn't mean you have to do something. So how can we influence this area? From my experience, the amygdala, especially its label making feature, is a key player in long term pattern change. Why? Because how quickly it intensifies our emotional response is closely tied to the meaning or the interpretation that's assigned to any experience we're having. Think about this. Remember the thermostat example that we did where how high or how low it's set will determine how quickly the air conditioning system turns on? Well, in that example, the activation threshold is in part determined by how you define comfortable household temperature. Or said another way, it's defined by the meaning you give the term comfortable. Now, staying with this example, when I first met my husband, his brain had comfortable living defined or labeled as 63 degrees. And my brain had comfortable living defined or labeled as 74 degrees. And because we both had habitual feedback loops established and running efficiently based on those meanings, the meanings actually influenced our body response and in turn directed our behavior. Because of my brain's meaning, my body would shudder and I would put on a coat at anything under 74 degrees, believing it was too cold. <laughs> and because of his brain's meaning, he would start sweating at anything above 63 degrees, believing it was too hot. Now, either were either of those labels or definitions factual? No. The human body can perform well in either of those temperatures. So what did we do? We decided that 70 degrees on hot days would become comfortable for both of us. In other words, we each intentionally changed our definition or the meaning of what comfortable household living would be. Now, did his body stop sweating right away or did my body instantly stop shivering? No, of course not. Although we had changed our belief in a moment, it takes time and repetition for brain change to occur and then physiologically stick and become the body's new default way of operating. This is the part that many well-meaning mindset practitioners leave out. Why did it take time and repetition for it to stick? I bet you're starting to piece the answer together yourself. Because prior to that mutual decision on what household temperature would be comfortable for both of us, we each had a long-standing comfortable pattern established that our brain was initially conflicted with and of course, tried to reestablish for energy efficiency, right? But over time, when we did not reinforce the old feedback loops by gradually choosing not to put on a sweater when I felt cooler, or by him choosing not to stick his head in the freezer whenever he felt hot, our brains and bodies finally registered the new meaning message that 70 degrees was just fine for both of us. Now, he doesn't start sweating as quickly, and I don't shiver quite as much or as, as soon, as quickly. He's raised his threshold for heat tolerance and I've raised my threshold for cold tolerance. And it all started by assigning a different meaning to or definition to what our brains had labeled as comfortable living temperatures. How you behave is in part shaped by the meaning you have assigned to an item, an experience, or a person. So by changing the meaning, you can change the behavior. Now, let's do an everyday individual example. Say you wake up and spill your coffee. 
which puts you late leaving for work to clean it up and you arrive at work and you can't find the meeting notes that you were supposed to present and now you're scrambling. Then midday, your best friend calls and says she can't make the movie date you had planned. So how's your day going? <laughs> well, without changing the facts or anything that happened, if your brain has a good day defined as everything going as planned and expected, well, then your fight or flight system is going to be turned on all day long and getting a workout. And if you respond to people by being snippy, being short with people or ruminating on how crappy the day has been, you're simply reinforcing a pattern that says perfection equals happiness. And your life dissatisfaction stays the same. But if instead you're a flexible thinker and consider a different definition of a good day, like maybe one that says that a good day is where helpful things happen that I either learn from or grow from. Well, then, after repetitiously in installing this definition, not much is going to set off your fight or flight re response, right? Your spilling coffee perhaps drew your attention to the fact that you went to bed later and didn't get as much sleep as you needed. That's adjustable. You not being able to find your meeting notes may help you to see where you can become more organized. That's doable. Your friend canceling, sure, that's disappointing, but you won't die. And now you have time to go to the gym and start that book you've been putting off. So can you start to see how the meanings and labels that your brain assigns can influence your body response? One definition tells your body, we need to keep the pressure on, stay alert and bust ass. And the other one tells your body, no worries. Some unexpected things came up, but we can still work with it. So too cold or comfortable? Agitated or calm and empowered? Your meanings and beliefs direct what happens in your body. So putting the amygdala's coordinator speed together with its meaning assignment feature teaches us that we can positively influence that threshold for emotional response activation in more than one way. First, by slowing down and allowing more time for choices to be considered. And second, by simply being more conscious of the meaning we assign to any experience. But this also gives us a lot of personal power. If I don't like the association that I already have to some experience or some person, I can choose to assign other possible meanings or interpretations like we just went over. I can choose to retrain my body response over time. Now, I'm not saying that that's easy either. Teaching your brain to not react and to give time to consider alternative opinions or to see things from a variety of mental positions, that takes time and effort, time and repetitive pattern interruption in order to install and galvanize new meanings and definitions into your brain. But it can be done if you're willing to do some consistent, repetitive mental work and be a bit uncomfortable for the first phase of your change work as your brain learns to deal with the new and different input that you're feeding it. Let's move on.